Good morning and welcome to worship on this fourth Sunday of Advent here at the First Presbyterian Church of Topeka where our mission is loving God, loving neighbors, and living with purpose. You can learn more about what we do and the ways you can get involved on our website, www.fpctopeka.org. And whoever you are, wherever you are, we hope you'll join us online for our Christmas Eve worship with candlelight and communion beginning at 5 p.m. on Christmas Eve. If the 5 p.m. time slot does not fit your plans, the service will be available anytime after that as well. Friends, this is the beautiful winter day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Please join me in our call to worship. Happy are we who hear the joyful call to worship, for we walk in the light of God's presence. Let us worship God together, celebrating who God is and all that God has done. For God is our strength and our protection, the one in whom we trust. Confess our sins to the one whose mercy endures from generation to generation. You're invited to follow along in the prayer of confession. Faithful God, we know that you are always there to guide us, yet we often make plans without listening to you and discover that our human agendas can drown out our ability to hear your will for us. We repent of these faults and turn to you in love. Forgive our offenses and pardon our sins that our lives may magnify your holy name forever. Amen. Sisters and brothers, by the faith of Christ, your sins are forgiven. Blessed be the God of our salvation, whose mercy is everlasting.
Good morning, young disciples. It's time to light the Advent candles. We've been lighting one candle each week that represents the four weeks, the four Sundays before Christmas Eve. The first week, we lit one of these purple candles, which was the candle of hope because Jesus is our hope. And then the next Sunday, we lit the candle of peace because Jesus teaches us that through him, peace is possible. And then last Sunday, Sandra lit the joy candle. It's, it's pink. It's a different color because Jesus is our joy. Well, this morning, we're going to light the fourth candle, which is the candle of love. And we are reminded that Jesus taught us to love our neighbor as ourselves. That's part of the mission of this church is to love our neighbors. We're not lighting the center candle yet, which is the Christ candle, but be here on Christmas Eve when we light that one. Let's pray. Teach us to love, O oh Lord. May we always remember to put you first as we follow in Christ's footsteps, that we may know your love and show it in our lives. Amen. Before our scripture readings, let us pray. Astonishing God, send your Holy Spirit upon us as we await the coming of your Son. Fill us with good things that we may glorify you according to your word, through Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. Our first scripture reading this morning is Psalm 89, verses 1 through 4 and 19 through 26. I will sing of your steadfast love, O Lord, forever. With my mouth I will proclaim your faithfulness to all generations. I declare that your steadfast love is established forever. Your faithfulness is as firm as the heavens. You said, I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to my servant David, I will establish your descendants forever and build your throne for all generations. Then you spoke in a vision to your faithful one and said, I have set the crown on one who is mighty. I have exalted one chosen from the people. I have found my servant David. With my holy oil, I have anointed him. My hand shall always remain with him. My arm also shall strengthen him. The enemy shall not outwit him. The wicked shall not humble him. I will crush his foes before him and strike down those who hate him. My faithfulness and steadfast love shall be with him, and in my name his horn shall be exalted. I will set his hand on the sea and his right hand on the rivers. He shall cry to me, you are my father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. Our second scripture reading is this familiar story from Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 38. Hear the word of the Lord. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great 
and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy. He will be called Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month for her who was said to be barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Mary is famous for saying yes to God. When Gabriel shows up and makes his outrageous announcement, Mary's only question is, how? And when Gabriel explains the Holy Spirit will overshadow her, and oh, by the way, the child will be called the Son of God, her reply is, here I am, let it be. And with that humble, trusting response, Mary becomes the role model for all the rest of us. This is how we respond to God. Yes, God, let it be. But what exactly does saying yes to God mean for us today? I mean, do any of us walk around consciously saying, no, God? Well, maybe sometimes. But most of the time, don't we try to say yes? And what are we saying when we say yes to God? Well, for the answer, I think we need to go back to the beginning of the story when Luke says that the angel Gabriel was sent to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph, and the virgin's name was Mary. Well, that right there tells us a lot. Two people are engaged, and that means there's some planning going on. Families are planning a wedding, which in those days was a big event that stretched over several days and probably involved the whole entire town. Joseph is busy planning to make preparations to welcome his new bride into his home when the time comes. Mary is planning to leave her childhood home and begin a new life with her husband. Lots and lots of planning going on, and it's all good stuff. But God has some plans, too. In fact, from the way Gabriel talks, it kind of sounds like God has been planning for a while now. And the plans have apparently reached the point where it's time to let Mary in on it. Kind of like when you're planning a surprise trip for somebody and at the last minute you tell them about it so they can pack their suitcase with the right kind of clothes. And it's interesting to speculate how God's plans may have impacted Mary and Joseph and the family's plans. Was the wedding any different because the bride was now expecting how about those first months of married life, which began not with a romantic honeymoon, but a new baby? I was reflecting this week on how 
the pandemic has pretty much toppled so many of our human plans. If we were gathering in person today, I'd say raise your hand if the pandemic has messed with any of your plans this year. And I would expect that every hand in the room would go up. The pandemic is teaching us both the importance of good and careful planning and at the same time, it's also teaching us the power of a tiny little virus to wreak havoc with our most cherished plans. Well, several years ago when my daughter Rachel was applying to different colleges as a senior in high school. She longed, she yearned for the adventure of going to college far, far away from home. She was ready to get out of the Midwest and see something new. She considered colleges on the East Coast and colleges on the West Coast and even though it's only 90 minutes from home, Rachel finally settled on William Jewell College in Liberty, Missouri. And she chose it only because she was accepted into a special program they have in which the students get to spend their junior year studying at the University of Oxford in Oxford, England. And she figured that that year in England would make up for the three years that she would spend in Liberty, Missouri. Well, it is now Rachel's junior year. And needless to say, the year abroad in England is not happening. Maybe if we're lucky, she gets to go next year but the delay has already thrown off her plans a little bit. And at the time, it seemed like a bitter disappointment. Although, of course, Rachel also realized what a small inconvenience that was in light of the tremendous human suffering the coronavirus has caused. However, Last month, there was a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day when my husband Rod died suddenly and unexpectedly from a pulmonary embolism. And I got on the phone like you do and started calling people. And when I called Rachel to tell her, she grabbed her things and hopped into the car and drove home which was only 90 minutes away. And she's been staying with me ever since, finishing her semester online and keeping me company as I grieve and try to get used to life without Rod. Rachel is the only person who could have done this. My older daughter is married and works as a cosmetologist in the Kansas City area. My parents, whom I love dearly, would have hovered over me and driven me nuts. My brother is a busy attorney. It had to be Rachel. And every day I look at her and I think, what would I have done without her these past few weeks? Now, I don't want to imply for one second that God brought about this pandemic so that I would have company when my husband passed away. I don't believe that. And I don't believe that Rachel was consciously thinking about saying yes to God as she drove home that November morning to be with her mother. But I do believe and I believe our scripture reading today supports this, that God does have plans for us, even in the midst of unspeakable events. 
When we say yes to God, we are saying, not my plans, but yours. It is a terrifying thing to say, but it creates the opening that God needs to come into our lives and work through us for the good of the world. Another example is my colleague, Pat Yancey. It was just last spring, I think it was, was it May 1st? May 1st, Pat said yes to moving from part-time to full-time ministry as our associate pastor. Well, by the end of May, I had a breast cancer diagnosis, and Pat had to step up and do probably far more than he ever bargained for, all while adjusting to the realities of full-time ministry. He had to do it all over again, and then some, after Rod passed away last month. That is a lot. That is a lot for a pastor and a congregation to experience in one year. Not to mention the challenges of doing church during a pandemic, the loss of our beloved assistant organist, Bob Jacoby, and the loss of so many precious church members this year. Just think how much more challenging everything would have been if Pat hadn't been here when these things happened. You cannot tell me that divine timing was not involved here. Although even without all those things, it's still hard to imagine First Presbyterian Church without Pat and his many gifts right now. When Mary said yes to God, the promise was God was going to do something wonderful through her. The promise did not include first-class accommodations, which is clear from the story of Jesus being born among livestock and placed in a feeding trough for a crib. The promise did not include an exemption from the stress and anxiety of parenting, as we see in the story of Jesus scaring his parents to death by staying behind in the temple in Jerusalem when he was 12 years old. The promise did not even include protection or even a cushion from what I imagine to be the worst pain in the world, which would be watching your firstborn child, your baby boy, suffer and die an excruciating and humiliating death by crucifixion. But saying yes to God means saying yes to all of life, not just the parts that are easy and fun. And we know that God kept God's promise to Mary, though the way God went about it probably didn't match up with anybody's expectations. Because Mary's gift was saying yes without conditions, without restrictions, without bargaining, or limitations, just yes. Which is really all any of us can do anyway. We can't control squat. We can only say yes or not. As the old saying goes, if you want to make God laugh, Make some plans. I don't know about you, but I think I've made God laugh a lot throughout my life. And I'm sure I'll give God plenty more laughs 
before I'm all done, but in a season when our own plans have had to change and change again and change some more, it's good to know that we are part of God's plan. And that God's plans are not only better than ours, but that they always seem to work out in the end. The Annunciation, as today's story is called, is our invitation to grab hold of our courage and our vulnerability and to say along with Mary, yes, Lord, not my plans, but yours. Let it be. Our spirits rejoice in God our Savior. With humble and grateful hearts, let us bring our offerings to God. If you'd like to donate to the ministry and mission of First Presbyterian Church, you can do that online through our website at fpctopeka.org. You can also mail your check to the church office if you'd like to do it that way. You know, this time of the year, we love to be together, and this pandemic makes it really hard for us to be together face to face, but we are still united together in our ministry to serve others in need, and that is the purpose of the Christmas joy offering. Half of the gifts through that offering go to educate and allow young people to grow in their faith through Presbyterian-related schools and in colleges equipping communities of color. And the other half of those gifts provide assistance to current and retired church workers and their families with critical financial needs. You can give online to the Christmas Joy Offering through the PCUSA website at pcusa.org slash Christmas Joy. Or you can mail a check to the church office made payable to First Presbyterian Church and indicate the Christmas Joy offering in the memo of that check. Will you please pray with me? Our spirits rejoice in God our Savior. Holy God, your love is magnified in the gift of your Son, whom you so freely share with us. Bless these gifts that we offer. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
we pray. Oh goodness, Lord, less than a week left. Can we get all the things done that we have before us? Have all the cards been mailed? The greetings extended? The gatherings and gifts coordinated and placed in our calendar for this last rush before the big day? Have we remembered everything? Have we forgotten anyone? It's easy to overlook the true reason for the season. That phrase which gets spoken a lot and is imprinted on bumper stickers and keychains and coffee mugs. We think that by posting a note that says Jesus is the reason for the season, we will truly be fulfilling our Christmas commitment. How foolish we are placing words on a refrigerator rather than in our hearts. We replace the magnificent story of God's incarnate word with pencil and wrapping paper and believe that we are ready to celebrate. When will we learn? Come to us now, comforting God, with your powerful words of healing. Help us to remember the witness of Mary a young girl who never expected to play such a role in salvation history. Put the brakes on our rushing and set us down to hear and receive your story of your absolute love for us and make us ready to respond, yes. Lord, help us to be mindful of all who are on our prayer list. We lift them to you at this time. They are in our hearts. Help us keep them there amid the distractions of this season. For those who are ill, we pray for your healing power, especially those who are battling this dreaded COVID virus. For those who grieve, who are lonely, struggling, or afraid, we ask that you grant them peace that only comes from you. Lord, shake us loose of the business of Christmas and get us ready for the birth of your Son, our Savior. Move us from the focus of our festivities to a focus on witnessing about your love through service to others. Challenge us to reach out to people in need, not only with a check, but also through action in ministries of sacrifice and service. In times such as this, remind us that we are called to proclaim your love through witness and service. These things we pray in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus, the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Indeed, it is less than a week until Christmas. So my charge to you is to take on a spiritual practice between now and Christmas Day. And here's what I invite you to do. I invite you to set aside a few minutes every day between now and Christmas. I recommend morning, but if you're not a morning person, do it another time. And I want you to find some time and space to be alone to sit quietly in the presence of the Lord. And I want you to put your hands on your lap, palms up and open, ready to receive whatever God wants to give you. And in that moment, I want you to close your eyes and picture Gabriel and picture Mary and picture yourself saying along with Mary, here am I the servant of the Lord. 
Let it be with me according to your word. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen.